All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, the session on preparing for the workplace of the future. Um, it's really great to be here with you. It's really great. We have a lineup of fantastic uh, panelists that will be doing justice to the conversation today. Um, I, I won't introduce them. Um, well, I'll, I'll just tell you their names. Um, and at the start of the conversation, they'll tell you a little bit about who they are, what they do. Um, to set a bit of background, um, we all see the evolution in the way the workplace is um, evolving at the moment, um, both in terms of digital technology and all the disruptions that are happening, but also um, looking at the demographics of our continent. We are a very youth-heavy uh, continent, which means a key challenge that we need to be thinking about is how do we get all these young people into sustainable livelihoods? As the world is evolving, what does that mean in terms of uh, jobs that are available? Um, and how do we prepare the young people on the continent, whether they have formal education or not, to be competitive in the world that we're, that we're evolving into? Um, I have uh, four panelists who will be joining me to um, engage on this conversation today. Um, First, I have um, Professor Tawana Kupe, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria in uh, South Africa. Uh, very welcome, Prof. Um, I have Dorothy Tunde Ajala, who is the she's a HR and Leadership advice, uh, advice, Advisor and a Coach and Trainer um, at Accelerate Leadership uh, in Nigeria. Then I have Alex Sado, who is the co-founder of Alliance for AI. Um, and I have Rudolf Ampofo, who is the Senior Regional Partnerships Manager for Sub-Saharan Africa at the Wikimedia Foundation. So um, I'll start with you, Prof. Professor Kupe. If you could just do a quick introduction of who you are and give you a quick overview of your thoughts around how we prepare young people for the future of work. Prof. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be on this panel and good afternoon to my fellow panelists. Um, as you said, Professor Tawana Kupi, I'm the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Pretoria's capital of South Africa, in South Africa. So the way we should do this, which is which we are already doing at the University of Pretoria, is to ensure that our curriculum is a is transformed in the following ways. First, all students must be taught what we call technology literacy, data literacy, and human literacy. But to do so, we must also ensure that the university is equipped to have the latest technological platforms for them to learn and to be taught and to learn and to do research using all of those. Why data literacy and technology literacy? Without those, basically, you are not part of what is unfolding as a fourth industrial revolution. So what we have done at the University of Pretoria since 2014 is to ensure that when it comes to teaching and learning, we follow a hybrid approach. Students must go online before they come to class, learn a lot of background, do quizzes and even pre-assessments. In class, the professors will use lots of technology to teach. We also use bots, for example, for tutoring. But post the class, the student must go back online and consolidate their knowledge and also do and submit assignments. Now, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Once COVID-19 hit, we all know that contact classes could, were no longer possible. So even our hybrid teaching and learning was no longer possible. Now the test was whether we could actually run online teaching in an effective way, precisely because our staff and students have technology literacy. And we've been using a hybrid approach. In other words, contact teaching plus online teaching at the same time, even if the students are in class and living in residence, we've been able to run synchronous, that means real-time classes all of the time. As I speak right now, there are students that are on class, learning on time, asking questions and interacting. We also did our June semester exams. More students wrote the exams than they did when we did hybrid teaching and learning. And in some subjects, students did even much better. We have also created, and I think perhaps I should end there, we have created four
intelligent systems, AI-driven systems to transform Africa and South Africa's uh, uh, um, uh, cities and, and, and also the transportation and mobility systems. So we are also forcing people, we also have created something called the Future Africa Institute and Campus, which is a physical campus. Think about how technology can address Africa's long-term complex, wicked problems of development and socioeconomic advancement. So I'll stop there for the time. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I'll come back to some of the points you raised um, in future questions. Um, Dorothy, um, tell us more about what you do and your thoughts on the topic around how you prepare the workforce of the future. You're mute. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, my apologies about that. So I'm a, my name is Dorothy Tulia Angela, like, uh, like I mentioned. Uh, I'm an HR lead. I have over uh, 20 years in uh, human resources, uh, uh, spanning various industries and also multinational organizations. I am a certified coach and um, a training facilitator. And I, and I also get the opportunity to speak at forums like this, both locally and internationally. So um, currently, I'm the lead consultant and CEO for Accelerate Leadership. Uh, yeah, so that's what I do right now. So, so just to uh, share my thoughts on the topic, which is uh, preparing uh, Africa for the future uh, of work. I, I just want to start by saying that uh, <clears throat> conversations around the future of work are really not new conversations. So uh, if you look at organizations like Deloitte, McKinsey, World Economic Forum, Glassdoor, Forbes, so for over like a decade, uh, and, and of course, us HR people, for over like a, a decade, we've been singing the song that the future of work is coming. The future of work is coming. And, and um, this is because uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has become the key driver uh, of the of the changing world of work uh, uh, um, as we know it today. So really, and particularly because organisations are beginning to adopt artificial intelligence, so the change really has been building for some time. It's not a new conversation. What has happened recently is that the um, should I say the onslaught of COVID-19 has kind of like accelerated the pace of change and is now forcing uh, business owners to begin to think about uh, uh, um, the way that, <clears throat> you know, they, we, they can begin to implement the, the, the so-called future of work. Basically what I'm saying is that the future of work is here. It's already here. Africa was not prepared for it. Um, there is now a lot of pressure. And so, uh, whereas a few global organizations had begun to plan for it, most uh, businesses uh, in Africa, particularly the local businesses, did not have a concrete plan for the future of work. So when we talk about the future of work generally, we're looking at it from uh, well, let me, let me look at it from three perspectives right now, which is the work, it's the work that is being done, um, what kind of work can be automated, uh, uh, and then we're also looking at it from the pers uh, 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 perspective of the workforce it's itself, who can do the work with new talent platforms and contracts and all of that, who are the people, are, are, are people really, you know, uh, skilled right now to do the work and whereas they are not skilled then we're talking about conversations like this about then preparing 
them uh, for that uh, 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 for them to acquire the necessary skills that are required to be able to play in the future work. The third thing you also want to look at is the workplace itself. How is the workplace? Um, how is it positioned? How is it? Where is you know where is work done? So basically, automation level, talent categories, physical distances. These are some of the issues that uh, you know we want to talk about. And um, I think I'll just leave it here for now and let someone speak and then come come back later. Yeah, thank you very much. I like the three dimensions that you you outlined. Um, Alex, I'll move to you. Um, AI is you're you're a big player in AI. And like like um, Dorothy mentioned, part of what we're looking at in the future of work is how work itself is done. What things will humans do? What, thing, what things will AI do? Um, there's lots of talk around AI also taking lots of jobs um, from from what we have currently as a structure of work as we have in the workplace. I know you're very you're very optimistic about AI. Um, but what do you see? What do you see as the, um, so tell us more about yourself and the work you do, but then tell us your general thoughts around this topic in the context of AI. Thank you very much, uh, Femi. Um, I, I, I feel like I'll be here to be adding color to what uh, some of the other speakers have mentioned, especially Dorothy just now. Uh, you see, the rate of change in the world is going to change. Uh, it's, it's accelerating. It's going to change faster than any of us uh, are thinking. Right. Um, I'll start off with like just four quick things to know about my background that informs my perspective on this topic FM is asking about. Uh, the first one is I grew up in the Asian city of Benin uh, a couple of decades ago, so I'm an Edo guy. Um, the second one is I, I led. Uh, <laughs> I hope people on the phone are friends of uh, of Edo people. Uh, I, I, I led. I am Edo, and I'm very happy to see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yes, uh, I, I led I led cloud computing uh, for NVIDIA. NVIDIA is in California. Uh, over there, we we built the fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, these are the very computers that are locking this future that we're talking about. Without these fast supercomputers, this future work world business is not possible. Uh, the third thing is I founded this uh, small nonprofit uh, as of now. Uh, where we, uh, you know, we channel the depths and strength of the African diaspora who are at, you know, the forefront of these technologies. We bring them together and see how they can support African governments, African students and African startups who actually, are, you know, just trying to, to, to go through the depths of these disruptive technologies and apply them to their lives. Uh, it's pretty small right now in terms of like the people who are interested, but hopefully we continue to drive awareness and more people get involved. And then the fourth thing is, uh, with our nonprofit outfit, one of our lead uh, sponsors is uh, Future Proofing Next. Uh, you know, they are one of a uh, leading global organization that is guiding global leaders on how to think about the future and what this future holds. Uh, and, and so with all of these perspectives informing me, going from the streets of Benin to like speaking to how global leaders are thinking about the world uh, one year from now, 10 years from now, these people have 30 years from now plans. Uh, when I think of the future of work, I think of the future of business, because without businesses that are growing and thriving, uh, there is no one hiring people. So there are no jobs without businesses and businesses are competitive when they keep up with trends, especially technology trends like artificial intelligence and many other technologies that exist from blockchain to uh, um, uh, 3D printing and all of those. When you don't keep up with these technologies, you tend to be a lot slower than your competition. You tend to be a lot more expensive than your competition. Imagine showing up to a bid trying to win consumers with someone who is using a jet <laughs> or a spaceship. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's no spaceships, but, you know, who is operating much faster and cheaper than you? You lose that deal. And when you lose that enough of those deals, you, you close down your shop. And with you goes the thousands of business, thousands of people you employ. And so in my view, there's no future of work on the African continent if the businesses are not staying competitive. I mean, if we took a short trip to the past, uh, there were many, many textile jobs in Nigeria, right? Uh, those jobs uh, disappeared when, when, when we opened our borders to free trade. 
and then you had the little David. I call it David and Goliath. They had to fight with the Goliath outside who had industrialization and they could not compete and with them lost 10,000 of jobs. Uh, AI is the new one where the big organizations are using AI now and they will just continue to eat up the local businesses we have. And so when people tell me that AI is going to destroy a lot of jobs, I say it's not because, uh, you know, it's in a different way than you are thinking. AI will destroy a lot of African jobs because Africa is not adopting AI. So how do we turn that around, help us adopt AI, uh, not in a way to automate people out of work, but in ways to create tools that enable more people to join the workforce. Uh, so I can add more color to all of that later on, but uh, this is my intro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for that. Uh, again, I'll come back to some of the themes you brought up uh, when we when we speak further. Um, Rudolf, uh, can you tell us quickly more about yourself and the work you do at Wikimedia, and then your thoughts on the subject? Sure. Thank you, Femi. Um, so, name is Rudolf. Um, I'm with the Wikimedia Foundation, leading um, partnerships in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, the primary goal of that role is to help grow the footprint of Wikipedia and other open source projects that we have within the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so as you might have guessed, um, the foundation is the nonprofit that hosts Wikipedia and 12 other open source projects that are edited by over 300,000 um, editors each month across the world. Um, and, you know, as we think about some of these talking points, it's, it really hits, you know, home because we are always thinking about how we can um, prepare our communities for the future. Um, and I, and I guess a lot of you might know Wikipedia as, you know, the place to go when you're looking for something, you Google and it comes up on Wikipedia. But what some people might not know is that there are over 53 million articles across 300 different languages globally on Wikipedia. So the English Wikipedia, you know, might have an Igbo version. It might have a Yoruba version. It might have, um, you know, a Kiswahili version. And this is all because of the hard work of the thousands of community volunteers um, across the globe that is contributing um, to, um, you know, Wikipedia and other projects. Um, so as I mentioned, it's when we when we think about preparing, you know, for the workplace of the future. We, from our perspective, we also think of it as preparing the skill sets for the future. Because as um, a lot of the panelists have mentioned. You know, having the jobs is one thing, but if you don't have the skill sets that are required to fill these jobs, it becomes, you know, um, you know, a bit redundant in itself because you don't have experienced people, skilled people filling these roles and taking it to where it can really go. So we try and look at it from the perspective of how do we build the capacities of our communities um, to really contribute to, you know, the projects and how we can share that knowledge with other organizations um, to leverage on um, capacity building, skills acquisition, and things like that, just to really drive, um, you know, um, the, the youth or individuals that they are interacting with as they think about the jobs of their future. Um, one of the things that I would like to say as I wrap up um, is that our products, you know, not only help people acquire knowledge, but also help them thrive in the workplace. So we keep people who contribute to Wikimedia projects are everyday people. They have their full-time jobs, but they are bringing themselves to these projects, building skills like um, navigating Wikipedia, utilizing tooling for making editing easier for the next editor who comes along. Um, so they are really playing around with platforms and technology that is moving towards the future because at Wikimedia Foundation, we are always thinking about how we anticipate the future and what we can do today um, in preparation for, you know, tomorrow. So our hope is that in the next 10 years, um, you know, the knowledge that workplaces need will be inclusive. It would be, you know, have a more multicultural, have different perspectives, but more, most importantly, it will have people with the skilled, um, you know, with, with the skilled hands that will drive them um, forward. So I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to contributing to the conversation. Thank you very much, Rudolf. Um, thank you all for for that introduction. I think you've given us a few interesting themes, which I'd like us to then uh, unpack a little bit further as we go on. Um, I'll come back to you, um, Prof. 
I like I like what you've described um, in terms of your hybrid approach to the curriculum in University of Pretoria. Um, however, I, I think um, you're probably more of an outlier on the continent as far as the way university education is done. Um, two, two questions I have, which I'd love to hear more from you around. Uh, the first is around your faculty. Um, how, do you, how did you transition to faculty that were all digitally literate and willing to play in the digital space? Because when I think about professors back in Nigeria where I studied, there's a very big resistance to digital because suddenly the professor who is supposed to be the expert suddenly is in a space where they are the learners and a certain part of their ego doesn't allow that transition to happen. So how did you manage it at the University of Pretoria? That's the first. And then the second is around your curriculum. How do you make your curriculum responsive to the fast pace of change of technology? Um, I, I went to University uh, of Afemeola University in Ife in Nigeria. Uh, three years ago, I went back to the university and discovered that the introduction to computing course, which all students in Faculty of Engineering had to take CSC 201, only four years ago was it changed, was the content changed from Fortran 77 to Java. Mm -hmm. Only four years ago. So how do you how do you how do you and think about how many programming languages have come and gone since Fortran 77 came in the in the scene? So how do you create how do you create curriculum and how do you ensure that your curriculum is uh, mm -hmm. in touch with the trends in the market? and the skills that are required, not just for now, but for the next five years. So I, I think you're quite right about being an outlier. Even in South Africa, we, our, our rather public, uh, where there are 26 public universities, they are not at the level at which we are. So I think that one of the things that is very important, which uh, happened at the University of Pretoria, that going back all the way to 1998, university has always been interested in the role of technology in education and the role of changing disruptive technologies in the space of education. So what the university did was to create a department called Education Innovation, EI as we call it. Now education innovation was not made up of just technical people who know how to use computers and programming. It's made up of those people from the IT division, but professors of education and professors of educational technologies as they evolve, if you like. So if you like, and also the university also has one of the largest engineering faculties in South Africa. We have at least 12,000 students registered in engineering alone out of our 55,000 students. And many of these professors are also interested in a range of things, not just IT, but artificial intelligence, big data, and all of that. So we have a big data center sponsored by big data chair and center sponsored by one of the banks, but also a professorship in artificial intelligence and related, uh, and related technologies and disruptive technologies. What we also then did was that to take teacher, to take professor training seriously. So when you come into the University of Pretoria, your induction it's also about how to teach, not just in the traditional classroom, but also how to use technologies in order to teach, especially innovative technologies. So that, that is also compulsory, if you like. But what also happened, which quick and change, if you like, you might also, all of you know that in 2015 and 16, South African universities were engulfed by protests. They were called fees must fall protests. And the students shut down the campuses so people could not come and learn. The University of Pretoria then used its uh, experimentation around technology to experiment with online teaching much more. They dis we discovered a number of things. One, you have to upgrade your technology platform, use some of the latest technologies, and train everybody to do so. So to a certain extent, circumstances and context force people to adopt new ways of teaching and learning. Even also, it's a university that was already amenable, if you like, and, and understanding the rapidity of technological change and this ability to disrupt the business that you have always been involved in. So a number of things then happened there. 
we said we also have to have a different mindset about teaching and learning. When you and I went to university, professors stood there, and in a sense, they looked at you as a person who they needed to fill information with and knowledge with, and then that is educated. We at the University of Pretoria and said, uh, do it in a different way. We adopted what we call inquiry-led learning, that you must get curious. You must teach students to be curious and to be inquisitive and, and also to be to actually appreciate all forms of innovation, not just technological innovation, but social and other forms of innovation. So inquiry-led learning starts all the way from first year and others. And that is where we also adopted the idea that what is that? What are the trends of the future that are important? Rapid technological change that is disruptive, one. Two, the increasing amounts of data and large amounts of data, which you can't deal with a, with a small computer, with a calculator, uh, and also trying to do it manually. But data analytics and also big data and data science are going to be important for the future. Then we also realize that in fact, we're talking about jobs of the future and the changing nature of work. We then say, so what to, how, how should our students be prepared? We created two streams, Ready for Work, which is an online free program for all students who are graduating and those who have graduated. Second, an entrepreneurship program and something we call tax innovation, which assists our students in the technology innovation space. And they are mentored by leading innovators and, and entrepreneurs in society. So as we speak right now, my latest project is to create a center for the study of the future of work. So in fact, in an hour from now, I'll be in that seminar, where there's a big seminar on the future of work and the study of the future of work and, and research. And then next year, I went to see the Nobel uh, organization in Sweden last year. They have an outreach program under an organization called Nobel Media, although I just got an email now. They're going to call it Nobel Outreach Media. I'll bring five Nobel Prize winners who have been doing research on the future of work. And they're going to engage business, government, academia, high schools. And at that occasion, I'll launch the Center for the Study of the Future of Work. So if you like the inquiry-led learning, entrepreneurship, ready for work skills, plus the research on the, how work is actually changing and how that should fit back into transforming the curricula so that it, to the extent possible, keeps up with rapid disruptive technologies. You can't quite keep up, but you should be almost quite close to the, as Alex said, the space and degree of change is, is beyond our own imagination. But you at least ought to be there from a platform technology point of view, from the practices of teaching and learning, or what we call pedagogy point of view. So that's, if you like, is how we have. So circumstances have forced us, but also interest has forced us. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, for, when, when I come back to you for the last your last statement, I'd love to hear from you around how your progress and the work you're doing can be scaled across the continent. Your ideas, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, um, sure. Dorothy, uh, very quickly for you. Um, so I like I like the way you 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 said the future is not is not um, is not coming. The future is already here. Um, and one of the things I hear employers say a lot, and people in HR say a lot, is that a lot of African graduates are not employable. Um, what do you see that needs to change in how we get young people employable at the point where they're getting into organizations and what needs to change in the way organizations structure work um, to make to one to be able to bring in people and rapidly upskill them but also to be able to uh, ensure that as people go in they actually have a pathway for growth that's conscious of the future <coughs> You have to unmute. Mm. We can hear you. So, yes. Uh, hear me now. Okay, I can't hear you. So, um, I, I was mute. That's why you didn't hear me. Great. 
So, so here's what, I, and I think you've already, um, someone mentioned, I'm not, I'm not sure, yeah, I think it was you, Femi, that mentioned about something around the curriculum that, are, that is taught in our universities, uh, where you said that um, uh, computer science, uh, one of the, you know, the topics in computer science was just changed four years ago. So, so in, mostly in, uh, and, and I really salute the University of Pretoria because what is being done is not what is common to uh, a lot of African universities, indigenous you know, universities. And, and that's so sad because we're still using the old method. I mean, I remember when I went to the university, if I, if I needed to research anything, I would go into the library. The books were written in 1970-something, 1960-something. And, you know, there was no updated information. Unfortunately, also maybe perhaps due to a lack of funding of some of these universities, you do not see them carrying out. In fact, the researches that come out of universities, even as we speak, they're, they're not, um, you can't compare them to what, uh, it, uh, what happens in the developed world. So for me, the first thing I would say, that the first change that needs to happen is at that it's not even just at the at the at the at the uh, uh, secondary school level, up to uh, and then the university level. So let me, here is what. So if you notice, a lot of African countries are also going into private as education, both at the secondary level and at the university level. And at those private organ um, um, uh, um, private organizations, they are trying to catch up with the. Um, with the developed world in terms of how education is is managed, how you know curriculum is taught. Um, I mean, I have an 11 year old who designed my, who knows about coding, um, who is teaching me one a thing or two. On Saturday, for example, she did a presentation on how to vlog, and uh, she taught myself and my friend. So you have some of those, but but you see how many people can really afford those types, those private. Um, 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 organized educational sector. How many people can afford them? At the university level, let me just give you an example of what happened not too long ago. So, because nobody knew what was going to happen to happen when COVID-19 came, uh, most private uh, schools moved onto the internet. You know, they basically automated their classes, as it were, to the level they could. And we had university professors, you know, in Nigeria arguing about how it's not sufficient. Hello, I, I mean, it was something I could not, I could not understand, I couldn't fathom. And that's why you see that there is a huge gap between people who attend public schools and the and the and the people who attend private schools. And that gap should not be there because. At the end of the day, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, what, what quality of people are we releasing into the world of work? So that's one thing. That's number one. There needs to be investment into education in African countries. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, and, there, and this has to be very fast because you, we don't want to be left behind. If we really want people to become uh, to be to become conversant with what is required as far uh, as far as uh, technology is concerned, then there should be a focus. And mind you, you know fully well that uh, a, a country that that is um, that takes technology as priority is one that is on the on the path to you know uh, 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 you know development and will reap the benefits of adopting technology. So investment in 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 uh, in uh, our school right. investment in the universities in the secondary schools is extremely important. Second thing is that there needs to be an overhaul of the curriculum because again when I went to school we right. were never we were not prepared for the world of work. There were two separate things. So you finished university and then you can, you go your first day of work and you have no clue what is being talked about. So again can I cut you can I cut you because I'm conscious of time. Okay. Yes, okay. I want I want to I want us to I want to hear from Alex and Rudolph. Okay. Because we only have 40 minutes. Thank Sadly, you. I think I think we don't have enough time for the conversation that is in front of us. Okay. But 
Alex, so it's interesting to to hear you say that Africa should adopt uh, AI more. Um, But there are people who argue that, well, we don't even have the infrastructure. We don't even have technology. We don't even have electricity. So how do you see us leapfrogging all our deficiencies to a point where we are adopting AI more and it's firmly integrated into the way we work? Uh-huh. It's going to be very difficult, but um, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice to stay out of this. If we speak, we don't, we don't have a choice. Uh, with artificial intelligence, machine learning, these technologies, these products that are built are quite personalized. They are designed to work best for the people who design them. And if Africans are not designing them, they will not work for Africans. So you don't have a choice. Um, when you want to build these technologies, you don't need 1 billion Africans building them. You can have 10,000 Africans building these technologies. And we already have more than 10,000 Africans who know about these technologies. In Nigeria, you have Data Science Nigeria has trained over 10,000 people. In South Africa, you have the Deep Learning in Dawa after WITS. University of Wits, and then Pretoria. Uh, I know Professor Poposi, who's at University of Pretoria. He's one of the leading professors of AI across the continent. Uh, we have these 10,000 people. The people with resources just need to provide these 10,000 people with the fast computers they need, with the electricity and connectivity they need, so they can build solutions that work for Africans. So it is possible. Let's build African solutions from here. I will just touch on th- th- three other quick things before my time runs out, right? One of the, the first one is GPT-3. Uh, this is like the latest, newest thing in artificial intelligence in the whole world. Microsoft, Google, the biggest companies are just going hard at this. We announced it a few months ago in partnership with Microsoft and uh, OpenAI. What it does is it's now giving computers a better uh, ability to understand language, right? Spoken language. How that's going to uh, transform the world is we're going to move from needing to touch your screen, type on your keyboard, to where you can now speak to a computer, you can speak to your phone, you can speak to your car. That's going to transform the kind of product, products that are produced. And we need Africans building those for African language. That's one. Number two is internships, importance of internships. Uh, our students need to be interning with the uh, companies so that way we are sure that they are learning the right thing. Right? I, uh, my great mentor, one of my mentors, uh, Aubrey Hubri, runs a big podcast. And on that podcast, I heard about Fermi for the first time. I think he presented about Tiesto, his uh, new platform. And one of the things they do is they connect thousands of, they've come up with a, with, with a revolutionary way to connect thousands of students with internships. Uh, and I think there's a lot for businesses and companies to learn from that. Uh, the last one is uh, the importance of, like our universities, I think there's something structural that's preventing them from changing their curriculums. Otherwise, we've talked about this for 30 years, they will still won't change the curriculum. There's something structural. And so before that changes, I say that we come we, we come up with some, some ways to just help the students that are there now. In my time, I was a pretty average student till I was 13, till I was then giving extra lessons. And then I became decently good at math and physics and won a couple of Olympiads. Uh, today, there can be extra lessons on AI 3D printing. There can be extra lessons on AI clubs in universities where perhaps it takes them longer to change, right? That's one thing I would love to help with. We've started these AI clubs in Alliance for AI, and we help university students who want to start and form their own AI clubs, and we connect them across the African continent so they can work together and grow. So that's, uh, I think I'll pause my message there. Thank you very much. Um, Rudolf, I'll, I'll go to you. So can you can you you're already in the in the mix in the mix? Uh, you have three hundred thousand a community of three hundred thousand people. What pers- what proportion of these are Africans? Uh, what kind of skills are they learning, and how are they translating those skills into uh, livelihood? Because I know your projects are open source, which means they're doing it voluntarily. But of course, they're building skills that are useful for work. Is there any support for them to make that transition? So if someone learns a skill, is there support for them to be able to turn that into a way of earning income? Yeah, um, thank you so much, um, Femi. And I really like, you know, the the things that um, Prof and um, Dorothy and um, Alex have mentioned about um, skills development and creating a system to help drive um, 
growth within Africa. Um, as you mentioned, um, we have a lot of um, volunteers who contribute to Wikipedia and other open source projects every day. Um, as to, I don't have the exact number of, um, you know, Wikipedians or community volunteers that are coming out of Africa, but I know that um, we have about 23 communities and groups with thousands of individuals from Africa that are contributing to Wikimedia projects. Um, one of the things, one of our researchers indicated that less than 1% of um, contributions is coming from Africa to Wikipedia, um, which is, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting to, you know, think about when you look at Africa as, uh, you know, a really young population growing more than a billion people in there. So you're really wondering how do we get these individuals to contribute to Wikipedia and other, you know, open source projects. And as um, Dorothy and Alex were talking, I was saying that, why don't you just join the Wikimedia community? You get to learn how to edit, you get how to learn to research, you get to learn how to use tooling on Wikipedia and so many other things that we are, our, our team, our amazing team all over the world are doing just to really make sure that Wikipedia and the projects are safe and conducive and helping individuals build the necessary thing. So it's, it's really important for us to continuously do this and make sure that um, our volunteers are acquiring the skills. Now to the question about how do they transition into... Um, Can I ask that you answer that in 30 seconds? Because I'm very conscious we're exactly at 40 minutes mark and they told me not to <laughs> over time. So if you, sure. could, if you could end that and let's use that as your wrap up. Okay, yes. So um, in terms of transitioning into end income, I believe that it's also about bringing, getting the people with the right mindsets and coaching them enough. And that's something that the foundation does um, on a going basis to really try and empower individuals to pursue jobs. And it's out of these passions that they're used to drive into like different projects, setting up their own 